system that Brazil would see itself as a model for other countries? I think it, I think it does, um, or it tries to present itself as uh, developing the infrastructure and you know sort of capacity to be a model for other places. Yeah. Just thinking about the most recent visit of the Brazilian president, right, to the White House. I mean, she was very assertive mm -hmm. about precisely at that point. Mm -hmm. So, and that was not something you generally see from Latin American leaders coming to the White House. Yeah. So it doesn't change. There's this very big push for just global PR. This <laughs> yes. is part of obviously, right? And um, I think it is trying. There's. I just wonder if sometimes it maybe the PR is they're not trying too hard in a way to because if you keep on pushing this narrative, you might be seen as sort of like working a little too hard to <laughs> say something, right? Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if that's a effect of that. There's an article in the Guardian I think that said something that everybody wants yeah. to meet with research except one. Yeah, that's how I saw that. Yeah. And um, so it's funny that reaction to that whole thing about Dilma's visit to DC is like there is such a bifurcated view of you there, like Brazil is totally undervalued and we're totally uh, you know, the US doesn't just doesn't get it. And then there's this, all these other comments how like Brazil's just a poser, it's not there yet, you know, the, the US really doesn't need to be as sort of, you know, uh, aware of Brazil as as the Brazilians think they should be, so there does seem to be this like tension there, yes, right? So it's really, it is really interesting, and uh, um, but I think it is it is important to remember again that there are plenty of sort of planning models that have come out of Brazil in the past, right? That people tend to forget about, but that are relatively important, especially like sort of this mid-century modernism it develops as much in Brazil as it does out of like Corbusier, or like in other words, like. Corbusier couldn't have gotten as famous as he did without Costa and Niemeyer in Brazil. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. 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 were coming to terms and reckoning with what this reinvention of 
itself economically is another play. And really almost a turn in the narrative where now it's, there I'd say, a little more gendered with an emphasis on sport and things like the Olympics, right? Um, what does that historical geography look like for Rio in that sense, if you look at that at all? Um, there's nothing historical precedent for you know these sort of massive urban beautification and chain programs like the sort of process of the house modernization in Rio, like uh, Mayor Pereira de Passos in like the 20s and the 20s. All the same kind of, you know, we're going to sanitize the city, aestheticize the city, make it more look, look more like Europe, you know. Or we're competing against Buenos Aires, who's doing the same thing, and what's, you know, who's better, Buenos Aires or Rio. So there is this sort of uh, uh, very similar kinds of logics about becoming mo more modern, more global, more competitive, uh, more orderly. So, that's definitely, and, and yeah, I think Brazil and her cities have had this long history of like massive planning, right? Like Brasilia and other kinds of centrally planned areas in in, in cities in Brazil. Um, so in some ways, it's a continuation of existing uh, patterns. Um, maybe some differences would be just just a greater intensity of the kinds of transnational interactions that happen in development in Rio. So you, can, you can't really see development in Rio as separate at all from development in London or development in Barcelona. It's really one sort of transnationalized, globalized industry of doing this kind of development. And it's, it's in a way, there's so you just sort of what's a little bit newer about this kind of, like, you know, mega events now is the, the more intense relational transnational aspect of it where you can hardly say that you know, Rio is doing it. Even though people still think very much in terms of cities, Rio and Beijing, the actual production of these events are not at all local. I mean, they're local, but they're totally transnational at the same time. That's, that's more intense than it was in the past. All right. Uh, why don't we take a short break and come back in about issue has got to be addressed. Um, I do not know much about what's going on as far as the AFL operations there except for one thing and that is AFL-CIO and a number of the national international unions are major investors in Israel bonds. Okay. I don't know how much I have been told it's very substantial. Uh, so this is something that needs to be looked at. There's a man named Jeffrey Blankford who's in uh, uh, some part of Mendocino County, California, who's done a lot of work on this, and he would be the person that, that knows much more. So if you don't know him, you should, and he would be the person that could address this much more than mine. As far as I know, there's not any formal organization similar to U.S. law that's dealing with Palestine. I know there's a very, very small, but still seemingly to grow, growing number of trade unions that are trying to address that. Other than that, I just can't tell you, Alan. I just don't know. Good question. Uh, one point about Iraq, I'm, I'm not an expert at all, but one of the things I know is that Iraq is a clan-based society, and most clans had people that were both Shia and Sunni in them. So I think Carol's comments, and, 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 and David's as well, that this has been manufactured, this difference has been magnified by the occupation, is very true. And there's a lot of stuff we don't know and probably won't know for a long time on that. But it sure seems to be magnified all of a sudden in a whole different way since the occupation. Uh, as far as Will's question about the CBTU, um, partly, and, and Will, I'd sure love to have information on this, I don't know of a real study of the CBTU. Uh, there needs to be one. Um, I do know that in the mid-80s, roughly the time you're talking, somewhat of the time you're talking about, the, the National Labor Committee came up, and I know there were people that were probably in both organizations, but there's a lot I don't know. 
the important thing, what I think is different now, is that the National Labor Committee in, in particular, and I don't think this is so much about the CBTU, the National Labor Committee was National Labor Presidents, largely. It was a very top-level thing. One of the things that I think is brilliant, Carol's absolutely right, I think the folks running U.S. law have been brilliant in that they have started from the beginning and required, organi uh, required people that came to, I know the first, com uh, the, the, the founding conference in Chicago in October 2003, that they had to be mandated by their organizations. These were not individuals. And I think that's been brilliant. And I think that's one of the things that's led uh, U.S. labor against the war to be as powerful as it's been. It's more than just the tops. It's gotten down there much broader. Now, this thing that we're trying to do with the Worker to Worker uh, Solidarity Committee is much more the activists, the typical thing, the outside the labor movement, the raise hell and see if we can stimulate anything inside. But uh, the critique, the critique of the AFL's foreign policy is at a whole different level. I have been writing since 1989, no, 87 on their foreign policy. And the level of critique that we've got going is far beyond anything that came up during the 60s, and I would even argue the 80s. And there's a lot of knowledge. You'd be amazed. Um, I have a website. I, my university is Purdue North Central, which is referred to as PNC. And if you go to my website at, at uh, PNC, Purdue North Central, you, uh, I've got a link to my index. And one of the things I do is I list all the stuff that's been done on AFL-CIO foreign policy over the years. You'd be amazed at the amount of stuff that has been written over the years. The difference today, though, is that most of the stuff has been written by people who have done one article or one book, and that's it. And you never see them again. And it's people like Fred Hirsch, who I work with. Fred's the man that exposed AFIL's operations in Chile as early as 1974. Fred is still actively working on this issue. I've been involved, I'm a junior member, and I've been involved since 1983 on this stuff. And I'm still involved. And that gives us some institutional memory, and we know where, to coin a phrase, some of the bodies are buried, and we know what that is. And, and so they've been unable to throw us off because we know what happened. We were there in those meetings. We were doing those things. And that's, so that's a difference that I think that we have.
especially like sort of mid-century modern is uh, develops as much in Brazil as it does out of like Corbusier. Or like, the, in other words, like Corbusier couldn't have gotten as famous as he did without Costa and Niemeyer in Brazil. So it's just a reality relationship. There's this very big push for just global PR. This <laughs> yes. is, is part of obviously, right? Yeah. And um, I think it is trying. There's. I just wonder if sometimes it maybe the PR is they're not trying too hard in a way to because if you keep on pushing this narrative, you might be seen as sort of. During the revolution, and the story is from '76, I believe 1976, and uh, takes pictures of uh, idyllic. Uh, scenarios that are on the peasants uh, depicted, goes home and uh, with a little sip of rum that he probably got in the same place in his barrio Latino, looks at those uh, slides. And what he sees is scenes of uh, torture and massacres uh, that were occurring uh, in the 70s uh, uh, throughout Latin America, sort of pun, uh, pun torture kind of scenes. Mm -hmm and pan, pan dictatorship. And uh, in, in a way, his story, story is questioning uh, uh, what we buy and what we get uh, and what we repress and what we want to see and what we don't. But it's focusing on, uh, on the power of the object. Right. Working a little too hard to mm -hmm. say something, right? Uh, so I wonder if there's an effect of that. There's an article yeah. in The Guardian, I think, that said something that everybody wants yeah. to meet with Rousseff except the one. Right. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. Yeah. Um, so it's funny that reaction to that whole thing about Dilma's visit to DC is like there is such a bifurcated view of you there. Like Brazil is totally undervalued, and we're totally uh, you know the US doesn't just doesn't get it. And then there's this, all these other comments how like Brazil's just a poser; it's not there yet. You know the, the US really doesn't need to be as sort of you know uh, aware of Brazil as as the Brazilians think they should be. So. There does seem to be this like tension there, yes, right? So it's right. really, it is really interesting, and uh, um, but I think it is it is important to remember again that there are plenty of sort of planning models that have come out of Brazil in the past, right? That people tend to forget about. 